Gentlemen, this session is sponsored by Ralph C. Wilson Jr. Foundation. Please welcome former President and Chief Executive Officer of Gale Foods, Catherine M. Gale, and Bishop William Lawrence University Professor for Harvard Business School, Michael E. Porter. Hello, we are very thrilled to be here. I want to thank Sandy Barua for getting us here to beautiful Michigan and all of you for inviting us to your state. I'm actually from Wisconsin, but Michael is a Michigander by birth. So uh, we're both excited to be here. He might be just a little bit even more excited than I am. I want to start with a quick story about my daughter. So a couple of years ago when she was just nine, I was in the car with her and I said, hey honey, did you know that our deficit is $19 trillion? And she looks at me, a little horrified. No. And I said, yeah, and guess who's going to have to pay that back? Now she says, oh, you? Oh, no. Cute, but no. You, you're going to have to pay that back. To which she responds, me, what did I ever do? She loves being in the car with me. So as you can see from the conversations that I force upon my daughter, I care deeply about uh, our politics. As we all know, there is so much talk about the hyper-partisanship and the divided country. So I want to start with something on which virtually everyone agrees. Washington is broken. We say it all the time. But as my good friend, former Republican Congressman Mickey Edwards, originally explained, this idea is represents a real fundamental misunderstanding of the problem. In fact, Washington isn't broken. It's working exactly how it's designed to work. Question is, how can our political system be so perfectly designed and yet deliver such dismal results? The answer is simple. It wasn't designed for us. In reality, our system has been custom designed and continuously fine-tuned by and for the benefit of two gain-seeking organizations, our two political parties, and their industry allies, together these comprise effectively a duopoly, which we call the political industrial complex, and it is today virtually the only constituency that matters. This design has created an enormous problem, which we illustrate with a Venn diagram. Currently, there is no intersection between Congress acting in the public interest and their likelihood of getting reelected. So in other words, if America's representatives do their jobs the way we want and need them to, they're likely to lose those jobs, which is a crazy design. Fortunately, we can fix it. So in 2016, I asked Michael to join me on a new approach to fixing our politics using the tools of competition and industry analysis that he originally developed to understand competition in for-profit industries, to use them now to analyze the industry of politics. As you may know, this type of analysis has been the gold standard for decades to understand competition in other industries. And using these tools to look at politics sheds new light on the failures because politics has become a major industry that functions like other industries. Our political problems are not due to a single cause and certainly not to a single politician, but rather to a failure of the nature of political competition that has been created. This is a systems problem. Please know that when we talk today, it is about politics, but it is not in any way political. Michael is a Massachusetts Republican. I was a Democrat. I now call myself a centrist independent or politically homeless. The problem is not <laughs> Democrats or Republicans or even the existence of parties. The problem is not individual politicians, most of whom bring to their jobs great talent and a true desire to serve the public interest. The problem is this nature of competition. And we're all trapped in it. 
Now, we were very clear right from the start that we wouldn't simply add to the depressing commentary about politics, but rather endeavor to figure out precisely what it would take to change the system powerfully enough to change the results that the system regularly delivers. And that's what today is about. So first, Michael's going to talk about what's at stake, and then I will come back and tell you why everything's screwed up, who's to blame, but most importantly, how to fix it. Michael. Well, thank you, Catherine, and thank you all for, for being here uh, and uh, to talk about this topic, which uh, the reason I'm here is uh, I came to understand because of Catherine's uh, experience and in-depth uh, exposure to politics that actually this was the most consequential issue uh, that would really shape the future of our country. And let me, let me talk about a little bit about why. Uh, you know, I'm a strategy professor. I work on competitiveness and economic development. Politics is literally the last thing I ever thought I would work on. I wanted to get out and do policy and make things happen, you know, in the world. Uh, but all that changed uh, because of Catherine. Uh, she helped me understand what was going on here and what was stake, uh, at stake. And also, I had the opportunity at Harvard Business School to co-chair a multi-year project that we took on, which I'm very proud of, which was really trying to understand the disturbing performance in the American economy uh, that began well before the Great Recession. We have seen things over the last 10 or 20 years that we never saw in the last 100 years in terms of our economic performance. Things that, that are, are scary in, in terms of long-term trends that broke. And we at the school were trying to understand what's going on. So we did a very uh, substantial body of work on this involving alumni surveys and many other kinds of work to try to understand what was really happening here. And to kind of summarize what we found, uh, you know, here's just one chart. It's a classic HBS two by two matrix, okay? Um, and what you see here is that on the upper right-hand corner, we in America have enormous economic strengths, stronger than ever in areas like innovation, in areas like entrepreneurship, in areas like our great universities and others. And those strengths are getting stronger. But yet, as we look more broadly at our business environment and what is going on in the economy, we start to see a growing array of alarming economic weaknesses, um, well known to all of us. Inadequate worker skills. We just have too many workers that don't have the skills to do the modern jobs that they would like to have. Poor infrastructure, complex regulation, a very high cost uh, legal system, an unsustainable federal budget that Catherine's going to have to pay for, not her daughter. These weaknesses have been leading to rising inequality. Uh, many Americans not earning a living wage. Very low workforce participation, the, purpo the proportion of working age Americans actually working in the workforce, which is at a 40 year low uh, today, despite the low unemployment rate. Record 40 year unemployment rate. Actually, that's not the real unemployment rate. If you do the math correctly and really account for all the people that are not able to work the way they want to work or even get a job, uh, the true unemployment today, we believe, is at least 10%. And yet we've had this fog, which has uh, been uh, told to us to convince us that uh, everything's, everything's okay. Now, if you look at this chart and look at the upper right-hand quadrant I just talked about, what you see is pretty much everything in that box is in the private sector, almost everything. It's the private sector that's created those strengths. If you look at the lower left-hand box, the areas where we're significantly weak and where we're deteriorating, things are getting worse, the things in that box, whose job are those? Government. Almost every single one. Um, and when we asked our Harvard Business School alumni where to put the political system on this chart, you can see where they put it. Our alumni, uh, distinguished business leaders from all over the world and, and all over America and almost every industry, put it in the weakness and deteriorating. In fact, it's our most significant economic problem in their view. Um, 
we at HBS, we were naive. Uh, we put together an eight-point plan of all the critical things that had to happen if you wanted to get our, com uh, job, our economy moving again. Um, and we went to Washington many times, and, and uh, uh, how naive I was. Because I, I met with hundreds of members of Congress, intelligent people, thoughtful people. Virtually every single one I met with agreed with the diagnosis that we had published in a, re in a substantial report. And they also agreed with our recommendations and what needed to be done in this so-called eight-point plan. But guess what? It turned out that nothing has gotten done on any of those areas. In fact, if you go back, you can see nothing has gotten done for decades, not just the last few years. We've made no real progress, despite the fact that everybody so-called agrees. Now, our economic performance is disturbing enough, if you really understand it. But it's only, it's, it's actually worse than that. Uh, because we, the, the, the other part of our job, if we're going to have a successful uh, country and a successful economy, is we've got to improve social performance. The things we do to equip people and educate people and have a, have a good society. Um, and uh, historically, the US was a leader. We invented universal public education in this country. We invented a lot of the best practices in social progress in the world. We were a leader. Uh, and most Americans still believe we are the leader. Uh, but it turned out that we'd never had any way of testing that. Um, and I led a group that created something called the Social Progress Index, which is the first objective data that allows us to compare across many, many countries a hundred countries around the world in terms of how we're doing on the social agenda. Uh, and this chart just shows you a little piece of that data. And it compares the US to other OECD countries. These are the other advanced countries. These are our peers around the world, the closest peers. And what do you see here? We see here a country where uh, we are now at the bottom of the OECD on many indicators of social performance. Uh, we, we've highlighted a few. We're 35th in secondary school enrollments. How are we equipping young people to, to have a prosperous life if, if we're 35th on secondary school enrollment? That's high school. Uh, homicide rate, you see uh, 34th. Uh, discrimination and violence against uh, minorities, you see 28. And there's more and more and more, including, and nobody in this room is going to be surprised, safe water. We're way down among na nations in terms of safe water. We've allowed our social agenda to atrophy. Uh, and there's many, many examples of that. Now, finally, with this data and the data I showed you a minute ago, we had some real data on how our government is performing and what we're getting done in this country. And the answer is, our government is not delivering solutions to our most significant economic and social challenges. Our government is failing to perform. It's not getting things done. I was frustrated by this and also mystified. You know, we know what we need to do. It's not a secret. Why haven't we done it? I didn't know. I was a policy guy. But enter Catherine, who has spent a lot of time digging into politics in America and participating in a variety of different ways. She told me something I almost, you know, had a heart attack when she told me this. She said, there's no way, absolutely no way, that any of this stuff that you're talking about is ever going to happen. No matter how many plans Harvard Business School releases, and no, how, no matter how many trips I take to Washington, this is not a policy problem we have in America. We're pretty good at policy. It's not, a, it's not a, even a politician problem. It's not the people. It's the system. The political system is blocking progress, blocking good results. 
And as Catherine just said, she had then this remarkable insight, which was life-changing for me. She said, we could look at politics as an industry. Because we got parties competing, what are they competing on? And how can we understand how these fierce competitors are not getting anything done? Uh, and so I joined her work in uh, 2016 and became obsessed with this. It's so consequential. If we don't change this trajectory of results, our divisions in this country are only going to grow. So to really understand what's going on here, let me turn it over to Catherine and we can start digging in and peeling this onion of what's wrong with our political system. Catherine. Thank you. So let's go back to what I said before, that Washington is broken. And as I said, that's not actually the case. It's working exactly how it's designed to work. It's designed by and for the benefit of the political industrial complex, not for citizens, not for voters, and certainly not for the public interest. With just a peek under the proverbial hood, we can see that politics operates very differently than what most of us have assumed. And I'm going to give you two quick real life examples. So think back to when Joe Biden became president of the United, uh, vice president of the United States. Oops. Someone can tape that and give it to him, and then he'll be my friend. OK, so his Senate seat in Delaware was then open. And everybody in Delaware, I'm told, knew who was going to be the next senator from the state of Delaware, because it was their most their popular ex-governor, multiple-term congressman, Mike Castle. Mike Castle ran in his Republican primary and he lost. Shocking, but not insurmountable. It was, after all, only the primary. So the most popular politician in the state could go on the general election ballot as an independent in November, and he would have run at one. But you've never heard of a Senator Mike Castle. And the reason is because Delaware has a bit of a crazy law. It's called the sore loser law. And what that says is if you run in your party's primary, Democrat or Republican, and you lose, you are not permitted to have your name on the general election ballot in November, no matter what the citizens of the state prefer. So a rational question is then, well, how many states have a crazy, undemocratic law like this one? And the answer is 44. And we're sitting in one today. Remember when Connecticut Senator Joe Lieberman lost his 2006 Democratic Senate primary, but then he ran as an independent on the general election ballot and won, proving that that's who the voters of Connecticut wanted for their senator? The only reason Joe Lieberman could do that is because Connecticut was one of then only four states that didn't have this sore loser law. There are a few other things that we need to understand about the hyper-importance of partisan primaries in our system. They may be publicly funded, but if we think about it, they really are selection processes for the standard bearer for private organizations. Primaries are the reason why so many people show up at the general election and think, I don't really like the choices that I have. Because most elections are really decided in the primary, especially in gerrymandered districts. And voters who turn out for the partisan primary tend, as a whole, to be further to the right and further to the left than the electorate as a whole. Therefore, to make it through the primary, candidates have to follow those directions. Even more alarming is that the influence of the partisan primary extends very directly into actual legislating, the business of government. So imagine yourself for a moment as a politician. It's not just what you have to say to get elected. It's now, once you're elected and you have an opportunity to consider a bipartisan compromise bill on, let's say, one of those really significant issues that Michael had about US competitiveness. The question, what are the operative questions you must ask yourself? Is this a good idea? Is this the right thing for the country? Is this what the majority of my constituents want? It's none of those. The question you must ask is, will I make it back through my partisan primary if I vote for this? 
And if the answer to that question is no, then the answers to all those other questions are virtually wholly irrelevant because the rational incentive to get reelected, even with the desire to do more good with your reelection, dictates you to vote no. Now, occasionally, principle might win the day and you decide to vote yes anyway, in opposition to your side of the political industrial complex. And then what happens? You'll be threatened with a primary, which, by the way, is no longer a noun. It's now a verb, as in we're going to primary you. And what that means is we're going to run someone further to the right, if you're a Republican, further to your left, if you're a Democrat. What it never means is we're going to run a more rational, consensus-oriented candidate to your middle. Partisan primaries, combined with partisan gerrymandering, are two key tools that the political industrial complex, this duopoly, uses to control the political process, and it effectively forces our elected officials both right and left, and hollows out the middle. This makes it very difficult to govern and provide solutions. We can start to understand why so little gets done in Washington, D.C. Now, I also want to consider a second example of our partisan system. And this one isn't from elections. It's from actually governing. The duopoly also perverts governance by controlling what we call the legislative machinery, which are the rules and practices that dictate the day-to-day -day, uh, process by which laws are made. So the Hastert rule, which you may have heard of, is a particularly egregious example of party control taking precedence over the legislature's ability to work collectively, even when citizens want it. The Hastert rule has become a well-accepted practice of the Speaker of the House, every one of them, Democrats and Republicans. What it says is that the Speaker will not allow a floor vote on a bill unless a majority of the majority, which is to say the Speaker's party, supports that bill, even if a majority of the entire House would vote to pass it. So unless speakers ignore this practice, which they do from time to time, but very rarely, even legislation supported by a majority of the country or a majority of the House has no chance of ever passing because there will not even be a vote in our democracy. Let's consider that 2013 government shutdown. That shutdown could have been entirely averted or ended earlier if then Speaker John Boehner had allowed a floor vote on legislation supported by a majority of the House, which is to say virtually uh, all the Democrats at, plus a minority of Republicans, and already support, passed by the Senate. And in fact, the shutdown ended only when the Speaker broke with his party and broke the Hastert rule to allow the vote. Effectively, this made-up rule, made up, cements majority party control in a legislature that's supposed to represent all US citizens. It costs the country $24 billion for a 16-day shutdown, which right from the start, 90% of the public didn't want. So think about it. In the context of your own organizations, if you wanted to solve your biggest problems, I suspect one thing you may not do is get everybody together in the room and then say, oh, but quick, before we get started, let's count off by twos and divide into warring teams, and then we'll get straight to work on this important problem. But that's how it is in Washington, DC, virtually every single day. Our founders actually warned to a man against political parties. As when John Adams said, there is nothing which I fear so much as a division of the republic into two great parties, each arranged under its leader and concerting measures in opposition to the other. Clearly, politics doesn't work quite the way Schoolhouse Rock once taught me that it did. <laughs> My daughter, the same one of the deficit car thing, now tells me uh, she, has, she has a great joke, which she thinks takes the place of my entire speech, so I promised her I'd share it with you. If con is the opposite of pro, then isn't Congress the opposite of progress? 
<laughs> My jokes are not as good as hers. It's really a bummer. OK. In the duopoly, the players advance their own interests instead of the public interest. And what's unique about the politics industry as compared to every other industry is that there's no independent regulation. The actors in the industry are the ones that themselves make the rules of the game. Many of us mistakenly think that the rules of the game are set in our Constitution, but it's not true. It turns out that most of the rules that govern the incentives driving day-to-day -day behavior are set by and for the political industrial complex and for their benefit. So for example, you've all heard of the pocket constitution. Now, I admit I forgot mine today. So this is a substitute prop. Here it is, because this is the size. In this constitution, there are six tiny paragraphs governing how the House and Senate are to work. And this is the House Rules Book. This is 1,500 pages of legislative machinery. And without even reading it, we all know what's not in here, which is best practices of problem solving. <laughs> and the Senate has the same one. 1,500 additional pages. What's in here is a book of how to divide up the spoils of power, and a book made up to serve partisans, not to solve problems. As is always the case in life, you could just look at that during my speech. Um, as is always the case in life, the rules of the game affect the way the game is played and affect the outcome of that game. And the net result of the rules of the game in our political system is unhealthy competition. Unhealthy competition in elections and unhealthy competition in legislating. And the result of unhealthy competition is always in every industry that customers are not well served. Thus, the actors in the political system are thriving and yet the American public has simply never been more dissatisfied. Just last fall, a new Gallup poll came out, and 61% of Americans think a major th uh, third party is needed. The percentage of Americans self-identifying as independents is at an all-time high as of July, last July, 43% independent versus 29% saying Democrat and 25% Republican. In any other industry this large, this thriving, with this much customer dissatisfaction, some entrepreneur, I think from Kellogg, where I got my MBA, Michael thinks from Harvard, but some entrepreneur would see it as a phenomenal business opportunity and would create a new competitor responding to what customers want. But that doesn't happen in politics, because as Michael is soon to show you, the duopoly works very well together in one particular way, and that is to rig the rules of the game jointly to protect themselves from new competition. They erect huge barriers to entry. Said another way, politics isn't broken, it's fixed. Okay, <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> All righty. This looks like a promising antitrust case. But as you will not now be surprised to know, ever so conveniently, antitrust legislation does not apply to the politics industry. Troublingly, there's no accountability for any of this. There's no accountability because the customer only has two choices. The only thing either party has to do to win is convince the voter to choose them as the lesser of two evils or to choose them because at least they say, therefore, what that voter believes. But what the parties do not have to do in this duopoly is to deliver results. Because no matter how disappointed you are, you still likely prefer what your side says, therefore, than what the one other side says, therefore. Therefore, instead of results in the public interest, we get gridlock. 
This chart shows the percentage of salient issues that are deadlocked in Congress. And we see a relentless increase from 1947 to the high water mark of 74% in 2014. And when we do get something done, it's partisan. This slide shows a striking implication of the industry structure, landmark legisla legislation used to pass with bipartisan support. See the combination of red and blue votes beginning on the left for Social Security, Highway, Civil Rights, Medicare, welfare reform. And then see today, only import, important legislation is now only passed on partisan lines. See all blue for healthcare and Dodd-Frank and all red for tax cuts. And when the other party retakes power, they focus not on improving but repealing. This happens in part because there simply aren't enough moderates left to bridge from the two sides. We see here the decline of moderates over time down to this current low on both sides. And everyone knows it's broken. Here we see the dramatic decline in public trust in federal government from 1958 to 2017. Now, if the competition in the politics industry were healthy, industry actors would be competing to advance the public interest. But we now know that's not true. And they'd be held accountable for that. And that's not true. So we will turn it over to Michael, who will explain the root cause. Thanks, Catherine. That's cheerful, isn't it? <laughs> um, so uh, how do we understand how this is working? You know, why we're not getting results? Why the public interest is not being served over and over and over again? Uh, and the, the technique that we used, which I think has been uh, which really revealed by looking at the game, that's being played is to really look at politics as an industry where the two major parties are competing fiercely. Uh, and they're competing fiercely to win elections. And they're competing fiercely to govern, to pass the legislation they want that they think will, will serve their members. Now, uh, many of you that have been exposed uh, potentially to this uh, framework, it's called the Five Forces Framework. It says that in any industry, there are some basic fundamental forces of competition that are at work, and that defines the nature of the competition that we observe uh, in the industry. So uh, in any industry, the core of competition is the rivals, the competitors. So that would be you know, Coke versus Pepsi, or uh, General Mills versus Kellogg's. And the rivals are, are you know, hashing it out and, and trying to win. Uh, trying to win. In the politics industry, the rivalry is between our two dominant political parties, the Republicans and the Democrats. There are none other. It's those two. Um, and they're competing, again, to you know, win elections and, and to govern, um, and, uh, but in their way, as we'll see later. Now, competition in any industry involves more than just the head-to-head -head rivals. Uh, and you can see the other actors here that would be present in any other industry. Uh, uh, we, you know, in any industry, we have customers, and we need to know who the customers are. Uh, and in this industry, the customers are us. We're the citizens. Uh, but as we'll see later, not all citizens are equally important to the parties. We're not all equal. Uh, even though in a democracy, you would think that, by definition, we should all be equal. Uh, there's channels for reaching the customer. Uh, you see the various channels in politics, and, and we've all experienced them. Um, um, and, and, and they're the way in which the, 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 the parties access us, uh, provide information, uh, uh, and try to influence our thinking. Um, and uh, we also see that uh, there's suppliers. In every industry, the suppliers provide the inputs necessary to compete. In this case, to run elections and to uh, govern. Uh, and there's a bunch of suppliers. I won't go through all of them uh, here. Uh, but what we'll end up seeing is these suppliers should not be really important to the competition because of the way this is, this is set up. Um, a critical dimension that Catherine has already discussed is barriers to entry. How hard is it to get in? 
What's the threat of new competition? Uh, and, uh, and there, uh, we've got an industry that we'll, we'll look at later, but you know, we haven't had a new party since 1854. So what is that telling us? I mean, a, a material new party that's got any significant numbers of people elected. So that's telling us something. We'll come back to that. And then finally, every industry faces what we call substitutes. These are alternative ways of competing, competing differently than the incumbents. So a great example would be Uber versus the traditional taxi industry. Uber came in, changed the competition, com competed in a better way, they thought, and look at how well they've done. Uh, in politics, the substitute would be, uh, prob the best substitute today would be independent candidates. The majority of Americans, or close to the majority, are, are independents. That's what they say they are. So, you know, uh, the substitute would be independents then come running, independents running, and really taking over uh, the, the, uh, the actual legislative body. So this lens gives us a framework to see if we can understand the root causes of what Catherine has described. Number one, polarization. Why is there so much polarization? Lack of solutions. Why aren't we getting anything done? Why aren't we passing the bills we know we need to pass uh, in order to advance our country's economy or to advance our country's social uh, performance? Uh, and, uh, and then finally, gridlock. This is what we're getting. We're getting polarization, lack of solutions, and gridlock. Why is that? And the answer, I think, is now hopefully uh, getting clearer and clearer to all of you, uh, we hope. Um, we have to understand how the parties are competing and what are they competing on. They're certainly not competing to please us. The average voter is, is not important. Uh, most of us don't understand how the parties really compete, but we have to if we're going to make progress here. And uh, we'll just give you a, a high-level view here, but uh, uh, we hope uh, you'll look at our uh, book, which will be coming out fairly soon, to go into the real detail here, because we have to understand this. We can't, we can't have a cartoon anymore of what really, how it really works. Um, now, the first thing we need to understand is that the politics industry is a duopoly. That means an industry with only two dominant competitors. There's not many industries like that. But what we know is if you have that structure, just too dominant, uh, it has a profound effect on how you compete. It also has a major influence on how you cooperate. And that's a point that Ka uh, Catherine has already introduced. The parties don't just compete, they cooperate. Well, what do they cooperate to do? Second key point here about this industry is uh, the most important customer is not the average voter. The parties are not competing for the average voter. They're not competing for the middle. Why? Because if you're competing for the average voter and you're competing for the middle, that's a sort of destructive competition, a zero-sum competition. Hard to win that competition. Uh, hard to preserve your, your success if you're competing that way. Uh, the parties actually instead, rather than going for the same voters, they've divided the voters. They've divided the voters into two powerful groups that they care the most about. Number one is the partisan primary voters that Catherine just mentioned, who, who as she said, are, are, are more, more partisan uh, than the average uh, citizen. Uh, and the other powerful customer are special interests. There's a whole lot of groups in this country who have interests uh, in whatever they do, teachers union or, or a business uh, roundtable, or, or, or there's a lot of groups. Uh, but the, the special interests are, the, are critical customer, but it's the special interests divided into two groups depending on which party's ideology they're most aligned with. So everybody with more of a democratic progressive ideology is in the Democratic Party's interest groups, and everybody on the other side is in the Republican interest groups. The other voters are ignored, have no influence. There's a lot of research that, that shows this in legislation. Uh, the third key point here is that the competition 
between the parties is not on solutions. If they really cared about solutions, we would have more solutions. What they care about, basically, is ideology. Their set of beliefs about the world and what it should look like. And we have, of course, two very different ideologies. What do we know about ideology? It's just too simple. It's not real. Ideology doesn't solve any problem. It's what you want or what they want. The solutions are always complicated. They always involve uh, uh, you know, many considerations. And we have to compromise to deliver real solutions. We can't just rest on ideology because we'll get stuck. Nothing will happen. This whole process of competing on, uh, on ideology divides voters. It doesn't bring them together around, oh, this is a practical solution, like uh, Social Security. Uh, it's this is the right thing to do, and this is the wrong thing to do, and the other party is our enemy. That's the way we're, the competition has been structured. The duopoly controls the key suppliers. Campaign talent is associated with one party or the other. The media are increasingly associated with one party or another. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, what's happened is that the suppliers, the key suppliers, are, have faced off one on the right and one on, group on the left. And essentially what you have is two very partisan camps who are just slugging it out uh, in, in, in elections and in governing to try to uh, uh, get their way. But you know, finally, despite the failure to deliver results, despite the incredible uh, non-support by the public, there's no new competition. And the reason is the barriers to entry are really high, really high. Economies of scale, control of suppliers, capture of channels, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's incredibly hard to enter this industry. Uh, nobody has in a long time, certainly no new party. Uh, but despite everything I've just said, the parties are very good at cooperating. Where it creates rules of the game that protect the parties from other competitors, make it harder for somebody else to come into the industry. Let me just give you one quick example. In fundraising, the parties set this rule. You can give $847,500 every year to a national political party candidate. If you want to give money to an independent, however, you can only give $5,400 every two years. So that's 313 times more you can give to a party candidate to an independent candidate. You know, independents, you know, they don't have a chance, except in very rare circumstances. It's no surprise we haven't had new competitors, uh, but it's particularly striking that we have no independents because 43% of Americans say that's what they are but yet we elect very few of them. Let me just conclude this section of the presentation by talking about the, what I would say and what Catherine would say, the horrifying implications of what I've just covered. Number one, the incentive of our political competition today is not to solve problems. That may sound harsh, but the longer we have a wedge issue, the longer immigration is out there unsolved, the, longer we're fighting over the budget, the more that happens, the more the loyal key customers of the parties are attached and motivated. Solving a problem takes it off the table. That's not what the parties very often do. They'd rather not do anything than violate or compromise uh, their ideology. We all kind of may get the sense of this, but another thing that's happened is the parties have extended partisanship beyond legislating. Now, uh, executive agencies and regulatory agencies like the FTC and even our courts have been infected by partisanship. The people that get appointed now to these very important positions in government, their number most important criteria is, are they a loyal partisan? We've, we've seen that play out in the Supreme Court recently. But that means that we're not picking the people that are the most even-handed, that are neutral, that are competent. We're actually picking the opposite. 
And business, I find, has gotten sucked into the game as well, in many cases. And then finally, there's really no countervailing forces. This is not going to change unless we change it. So in order to think about how to restore the system to something that will serve this country, uh, let me turn it back over to Catherine. Uh, thank you. Thank you. OK, we really are almost to the optimistic, forward-looking part. <laughs> <laughs> but first, I'd like to summarize the theory of change. In any game, boards games, sports games, serious games like politics, as we said, the rules of the game affect the way the game is played and affect the outcome of that game. So you can change the rules of the game. You can change the rules of the game in basketball and get a faster, slower game. People act all totally differently when we put the three-point line in. You can incent, um, you can thus change the way the game is played and alter these outcomes in powerful ways in basketball and in our democracy. Remember, the rules of the game for politics are mostly not in that tiny pocket constitution. They're made up. The problem, as I've said before, is that the rules are made up to serve partisans, not to solve problems. So to transform the system, we have to re-engineer the rules of the game to incent healthy competition on dimensions that matter to the public interest. And it is both that simple and that hard. What we need is a comprehensive reform strategy. Every innovation in our strategy is at the intersection of powerful, achievable, and partisan neutral. I'll define it. An innovation is powerful only if it addresses a root cause of the industry structure that we've just defined, a root cause of the unhealthy competition. It's achievable if we could theoretically measure success in years, not decades. Constitutional amendments need not apply. And it's partisan neutral because we have selected reforms that are not a Trojan horse for either party's separate advantage. Our innovations affect both sides of the duopoly equally in favor of the public interest. Now, as you might imagine, there are no reforms at the intersection of powerful, achievable, partisan, neutral, and easy. But <laughs> we do have these, and they are doable. So our work includes a comprehensive reform strategy with four pillars, which you see here. But today, I want to focus only on the first, because it's the most powerful first mover that we collectively need to engineer and have more chance of being successful sooner rather than later. We absolutely must re-engineer the elections machinery, the rules of the game for elections, period. So let me back up for a moment to the, review the two critical structural problems with our ele existing elections. First, the partisan primaries that I already talked about. Here's a way to think of it. They create an eye of the needle problem which makes it almost impossible for legislators to keep their eye on the public interest instead of on the ideological wing of their party, because they can't make it through the primary. The second problem is plurality voting, and this is one we don't usually think about. So in the US, elections can be won with a plurality of votes, but not necessarily a majority. So for example, a candidate can win a three-way race with 35% of the vote, the other two candidates, with 34% of the vote, the other two candidates getting 33%, which means that 66% of the voters in that race preferred someone else. More important than that, plurality voting is the single most critical barrier to new competition for two reasons. First, the spoiler argument. Sometimes we don't vote for the candidate we really want out of fear that we will inadvertently contribute to the election of the candidate we like the least. For example, in 2016, you may not vote for Gary Johnson because you'll take votes away from Trump and inadvertently help elect Hillary, spoil the election. You may not vote for Jill Stein because you'll take votes away from Hillary and spoil the election for her. And now we've got Howard Schultz, you know, the, the former CEO of Starbucks, contemplating an independent run for president. And not only are you not supposed to vote for him, but he's not even supposed to have the right to run. Politics is the only industry, industry where we are regularly told that less competition is better 
for the customer. Second problem with plurality voting is the wasted vote argument. So whenever you want to vote for someone that isn't likely to win, you're told you're wasting your vote if you're not you know, spoiling the election. And both the spoiler argument and the wasted vote argument are wielded proactively against all potential new competition to the duopoly, and these are a key reason why we don't have the healthy competition. They're a key reason why most new competition never makes it to the starting line, because they have a few meetings with political consultants in secret, and they're called by members of the duopoly and pressured out of the race before they get in. The two election innovations we propose, when implemented as a package, solve both of these problems, and they will fundamentally change what politicians are incented to do. So election machinery, number one, is to institute what we call top four primaries, and here's how it works. We're going to eliminate partisan primaries. So you don't vote in the Democrat primary or the Republican primary. You go on primary day, get one single ballot. All the c candidates are on that same ballot, no matter their party, Democrat, Republican, Independent, Green. And the top four finishers advance to the general election. Top four primaries eliminate the eye of the needle primary problem and thus allow legislatures significantly more leeway to legislate in the public interest. Election machinery innovation number two is to institute ranked choice voting in the general election. So here's how that works. Now we have the top four finishers from the single primary on the ballot. And now when I go to vote, I see my four choices and it's very easy. I pick my favorite, just like always. But then, if I want, I can also pick my second choice, my third choice, my fourth choice. I can rank as many or as few as I would like. Let's look at a ballot in a ranked choice election. Got these four, and I have as my first choice Alexandra Hamilton, because I like the musical. And then, <laughs> what, who'd I pick next? Let's see. Oh. Okay, so I'm second, George Washington, good guy, Thomas Jefferson, and James Madison is last for me. The polls close. The first place votes are counted, only the first place votes. And if someone gets a true majority, the election is over, that candidate wins. But if no one has a true majority, the candidate who came in last is eliminated from the race, and voters who had selected that candidate who's now out have their second place vote counted instead. The process continues until you have a true majority winner. It's basically a series of runoffs, but, without, but you cast all your votes at once instead of having to come back for repeated elections. Ranked choice voting eliminates both the spoiler and wasted vote arguments and ensures that we always elect the candidate with the broadest appeal to the most number of voters. These are not, by the way, crazy new ideas. Australia has voted this way for a century. And in America, all the way back in 2002, Alaska had a referendum to implement ranked choice voting. And at the time, a famous politician recorded a robocall supporting that referendum. And let's take a listen. I'll go one more time. Hello, this is Senator John McCain. I'm calling to urge your support for ballot measure one on August 27th. As a presidential candidate and as a senator, I've worked hard to open up the political process for all Americans. Ballot measure one will adopt a fairer voting method. It will lead to good government because Alaska will elect leaders who have the support of a majority of voters. Please vote yes on measure one on August 27th. Also in the same year, 2002, in Illinois, we had Illinois Senate Bill 1789, which proposed ranked choice voting for all statewide and congressional primaries. The sponsor, then State Senator Barack Obama. John McCain and Barack Obama, two talented, devoted public servants who knew how the game is played. They were ahead of their time on these innovations, but now that time has come. 
Together, these reforms, top four primaries and ranked choice voting will powerfully alter incentives and they will support the reinvigoration of a political middle. Let's reimagine Congress post-election machinery reform. Now, when members of Congress are presented with an opportunity to solve a pressing national problem by voting yes on a landmark piece of legislation, they can vote yes if it's in the public interest. They can say, well, under the old system, I never would have made it back through my primary if I vote for this. But under the new system, I think that I'll be in the top four. I mean, I'm the incumbent. I'm well known. I've done a good job. I'll be in the top four. And then in the general election, with a combination of first and second place votes together, I will craft a win. Elected officials now owe their election to a broader group of voters and are incented to be responsive to their entire district rather than a narrow swath of primary voters and special interests. The existing incentives for the scorched earth campaigning and the scorched earth committee hearings, which we see all the time, are reduced. But most importantly, again, the barriers to entry are dramatically lower for new competition, leading to healthy competition in the public interest. Let's go back to our Venn diagram. Remember this one? Under the current rules of the game in politics, there's virtually no intersection, no connection between acting the public interest and the likelihood of getting reelected. But here it is with the solution. We implement the election incentive, election innovations, top four primaries, and ranked choice voting, and create that intersection so that the actors in the politics industry are incented to do what we as a country need them to do, and that is the power of political innovation. So what's next? We need to pass these election reforms across the country. The US Constitution delegates every, uh, virtually everything about elections to the states, and so each state needs to change these rules individually. Every state can do it with legislation, but 26 states could also do it through a referendum campaign, which, for example, you would have access to here in Michigan. These efforts are in the works at an early stage throughout the entire country. Maine passed ranked choice voting almost a year ago on June 12th. I actually woke my daughter up after midnight to tell her that it passed because she knew, because I told her, that this was the most important election in her lifetime to date. Campaigns are being created across the country, including in my home state of Wisconsin. Sarah Eskridge, who's the executive director of Democracy Found in Wisconsin, which is our campaign, is here if any of you would like to meet her and talk about doing something similar in Michigan. And if you want to see these changes happen, then I usually talk to everybody here about the need to join or found a campaign and, of course, donate to them. But I'd like to take a moment and sort of go off the slide, because as a business leader, talking to a room full of business leaders, I wanted to leave you with some thoughts for business. US, you know this before you came in here. US competitiveness, capitalism, and democracy are at risk in our country. And we cannot elect our way out of this. We cannot lobby or relationship build our way out of this. We cannot wait our way out of it, expecting that it will change over time like a business cycle. This systemic problem predates and will outlive any individual president, include any individual politician, including any president. And the irony is that just as businesses feel the negative effects of declining US competitiveness, and the unpredictability of policymaking in DC, much of public sentiment blames business as the root cause. Now, we certainly can't let business off too easily by simply noting, as I just did, that business is also negatively affected. Business has no doubt contributed by playing the partisan game, even if we have felt we had no choice. But here's the thing, a functioning, Healthy democracy is a public resource, a public good, greater even than infrastructure or the education system or the environment, because all of those will inevitably follow the trajectory of the democracy. 
Business and business leaders are in a unique position to contribute to the revitalization of this public resource. Who knows better than business the value, the essential value of innovation, healthy competition, and accountability, all of which are non-existent in our politics? Who more than business has the resources and the stature to make the case for these political innovations to our state legislatures and governors and support the ballot initiatives right alongside the very frustrated grassroots. We're all in this together. The good news is that by publicly and energetically supporting structural political innovations like the two we propose today, business can simultaneously do three things. Help fix our broken politics for the good of all citizens, improve the business environment for their own good, and simultaneously confront the popular consensus that business special interests are the root cause of our country's problems. So please engage with us. We have response cards. You should have received them or you're at, at, at your seats. And we would love to hear back from you. Read and share our report from our website. Before we close, a few thoughts. Historically, the American political system was a critical foundation of the United States' success, and today it stands in the way of virtually every important issue we need to address. Yet we have every reason to be optimistic, perhaps even profoundly optimistic, because the reasons for our dysfunction are not a mystery, and we have more leverage in the system than we knew. This country was founded on what we can think of as the greatest political innovation of modern times, and political innovation is the key to our future. So I'll close with this invitation to action. Thomas Jefferson is said to have said, my HBS fact checker said he didn't really say it, but he should have. <laughs> we, don't, we don't have government by the majority in America. We have government by the majority who participate. And historically, at least for me, I thought that meant I needed to participate by voting or perhaps you know, getting engaged in supporting candidates or policy. But it turns out that what it means is that we also all have to participate in the design of the rules of the game of our democracy. So remember Benjamin Franklin, he was leaving the Constitutional Convention, and a woman asked him, so Mr. Franklin, what have you given us, a republic or a monarchy? And Benjamin Franklin replied, a republic, if you can keep it. Thank you so much for having us here today.